students. Welcome to um, the series of two, two um, review. <laughs> Let me start again. Welcome to the Nervous Nellies, uh, Just the Basics of Neuropatho, Part 1. <clears> there <throat> will be a two-part series of this. The nervous system is comprised of the central nervous system, which is basically the brain and the spinal cord, or some people refer to it as the body's control center. And the peripheral nervous system, which is comprised of 12 cranial nerves and 21 pairs of spinal nerves. Uh, also within the um, peripheral nervous system is the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So again, central is brain and spinal cord, peripheral nervous system, somatic and auto autonomic nervous system, which you can see here. The peripheral nervous system, as I said before, is comprised of the somatic and the nervous system, a somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system regulates voluntary control, so you think skeletal, spinal nerves, and so forth. And as you'll come to see, there'll be a motor component and a sensory component to the somatic nervous system. <clears throat> and within the autonomic nervous system, this, this system regulates the body's internal environment or involuntary control. And as I've said right along many, many times, um, it is comprised of the sympathetic nervous system, lower epi and epi, and uh, parasympathetic nervous system, acetylcholine being the chief uh, uh, transmitters. And I'll give you a little picture here of a diagram of the differences between the parasympathetic and sympathetic, and I'll go through it briefly, but you should commit this to memory. The parasympathetic uh, nervous system um, is sort of rest and digest. Some people call it uh, feeding and fooling around. Um, this is really the housekeeper of this, the body. Uh, it sets the basal motor tone for the body, the basal rate, uh, usually, et cetera, et cetera. The no, low energy rest state of the body. It tends towards pupillary constriction with accommodation for near vision. It increases the secretions for digestion, such as the GI tract, the saliva and bile, empties the bladder, and facilitates identification. The heart rate is slowed through the efforts of the vagus nerve, tends towards bronchial constriction, although not in a detrimental way, but the tone is certainly increased a little more. And the parasympathetic nervous system helps in, in, in uh, the process of sweating. Very important that you understand as practitioners what the uh, what anticholinergic effect can be. Those which block the parasympathetic nervous system or the acetyl or other transmitter acetylcholine. I love this little cartoon here. Can't pee, can't see, can't spit, can't shit. <laughs> uh, well, so I hope you um, enjoy that. I think it's pretty basic and um, a good way to remember what anticholinergic effects are. Another common um, way to remember it is this old adage, uh, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet, mad as a hatter. And all of this correlates to the blockade of the parasympathetic nervous system. And I've given you a little chart here, although the, the quality of the, it's not, it's a great chart, but the quality of the picture is not great. But these are all various anticholinergic drugs that you should be familiar with, particularly for those of you who are interested in caring for elders. I've also given you what's known in the business as the Beers List link. The Beers Link list, um, the Beers List is a list of medicines that really um, all elders should not be on. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's about 50 or 60 or maybe even more percentage of the list includes anticholinergic drugs because they they can be very toxic particularly in elders. So please, please do take note of that. It'd be very helpful for your practice. And of course, as we mentioned in class, the sympathetic nervous system is all about fighting and fleeing. You know, if you're a, t a camper uh, and you see a bear uh, and you're inside that tent, what are you going to do, right? You're going to think about fleeing, but more importantly, you'll see an increase in your heart rate and your blood pressure through the efforts of beta-1 receptors. You'll have a decrease in blood flow to the skin through your alpha-1 receptors. You'll have bronchial dilation. 
splanchnic blood flow uh, is decreased. Um, that is blood flow to the gut, so that blood is then um, shunted towards the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the brain. Um, that's why patients who are in constant states of stress suffer from stress ulcers, because there's less blood supply to the gut, and particularly in this case, to the stomach. They have pupillary dilation so that they can see far away to get away from the bear. They need to accommodate for far vision so that they can see the path to freedom. Within the liver, you need uh, increased energy so the liver produces more, more glucose. So increased gluconeogenesis. And you have increased blood flow to your skeletal muscles um, to allow, to facilitate the flea. <clears throat> the sympathetic nervous system also governs body temperature through the efforts of norepi-alpha. Remember, say that three times so you remember norepi-alpha. Norepi responds to alpha receptors. Um, and they activate acetylcholine in this case. That's why the parasympathetic nervous system is also um, involved. It's sort of a bipartisan group effort here. Uh, activates acetylcholine on motor end plates to initiate the sweating process. You also have increased sympathetic nervous system, which causes piloerection of hairs on your arms and limbs, um, otherwise known as goosebumps. And there are four uh, basic uh, neurotransmitter receptors uh, that you need to know. Um, alpha-1, norepi, as I said, norepi responds to norepinephrine, and it responds to all of these um, actions. And you should know these uh, more specifically now. Now we're breaking it down specifically according to which neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, and which receptor site, alpha-1. We really don't um, look at alpha-2s that much. They're just not that common. It's um, more of a central effect. Uh, the drug catapress is an example of an of a, a alpha-2 blocker, I believe. Um, but it's uh, just not, not that familiar. So really, look closely at alpha-1s. Then I think nurses generally always know about beta-1 and beta-2 because of the drugs that we use so frequently in practice today. So beta-1 responds to epinephrine, well, beta-2, they both respond to epinephrine. But beta-1 is primarily heart. Beta-2, the major effect that we see pharmacologically is bronchodilation, right? So you have, it, you have mimicking of the sympathetic nervous system or, or agonist effect of the sympathetic nervous system, which causes bronchodilation through the efforts of epinephrine, um, either endo endogenously or uh, uh, parenterally through inhalers, etc., causing bronchodilation. Unfortunately, you just can't get bronchodilation. You have to dial up all these effects. So be sure you're familiar with these. And then lastly, we have dopamine, which really uh, largely um, just uh, deals with the kidney. Dopamine receptors are responsible for dilation of renal vasculature um, at times of hemos hemodynamic stress. Neurons are the chief functioning cells of the nervous system, and their main function is to receive information, to integrate information, and transmit, transmit information to other cells. So I've given you an example of a typical neuronal, neuronal cell uh, with its uh, dendrites, its multipolar dendrites here, uh, to the soma, or the cell nucleus of the, axon, of the neuron. And then we have the myelin sheath, and then we have the axon terminals. I've also given you some pictures of other uh, uh, typical neurons um, here, and then some types of glial cells. Here we'll come close of different neurons, but more specialized neurons, particularly in the brain. <clears throat> so I sort of went over this already. I'm not going to go over this, but again, just make sure you're aware of the structure and function of a neuron. And an important point to remember here is that these neurons, uh, this myelin sheath, produce myelin through the efforts of Schwann cells. And then we have these nodes of uh, uh, Ranvier right here, right here, right here. See these nodes? So the um, action potential or the electron electrical impulse travels from uh, these.
these uh, dendrites into the cell soma, jumps to these nodes of Ranvier, and speeds up the um, uh, the propagation of the action potential uh, or depolarization. And the Schwann cells help in the myelin help to minimize any impulse uh, strength as they as they do that. Nodes of Ranvier. Action potentials, I'm not going to do a long dissertation on that because we have so much to do today. But you should be familiar with action potentials from your earlier studies. And if you're not, I highly suggest this short, um, uh, I think, four-minute uh, video on, on um, action potentials. You can stop your uh, podcast now and do it or come back later. But um, it's a great little action potential. And you'll need to know that um, because you should think about that in terms of how uh, how nervous system impulses travel are propagated, inhibited and propagated uh, to direct uh, activities and such. And not only that, but we'll come back to this again when we talk about the EKG. See how similar this uh, structure here that I'm highlighting looks to an EKG. So again, uh, we do talk a lot about electronic uh, stimulation in uh, neuropathology, but we also visit it when we talk about cardiac. So I take a few minutes and refresh your memory on that. Largely, it is the propagation of the electrical sim, uh, signal or stimulus down the, um, the myelin sheath to, to the um, axons and then to the, the, to the next cell and so forth. And it works through a propagation of these little uh, cells opening and closing sodium and potassium channels <coughs> to propagate the, the, the stimulus. And <clears throat> at the end result, uh, we're looking at the propagation across a synapse. And the propagation uh, of an action potential, or the velocity of an action potential, is really depends upon the fiber diameter, whether it's myelin or unmyelinated. Larger fiber neurons, nerve fibers, large nerve fibers conduct faster. There's less resistance to local current and myelinated cells propagate the most and the fastest. And again, if you haven't thought about synapse in a while, um, I would highly suggest another four minute uh, synaptic video, which just shows you how uh, the propagation across the synapse actually occurs, across the synaptic cleft, where you have a neuron, for instance, uh, activating a motor end plate. And what actually happens here with calcium release, allowing the neurotransmitters to pass over, and then what happens on the receiving end. It's very important, a complex uh, set of uh, factors that have to be all in alignment for this to occur. And it might be good for you to review that. One of the most important factors when we think about synapse is that calcium is necessary for this process. Calcium infuses into the axon, causing depolarization of the terminal. Calcium infuses across the axon, causing depolarization. The absence of calcium disrupts this relationship. And therefore, this loss of, uh, a loss of calcium ions diminishes the ability for neurotransmitters to cross. Now that becomes important because many of our patients who, through certain illnesses, uh, uh, have a, a hypocalcemia. Remember, hypercalcemia generally is not the case uh, unless in cancer. So really, the problems more reside in this hypocalcemic state. Calcium. So, as I said, it's so important for calcium to be regulated because if you have increased calcium levels in the blood, you have less sodium channels open, you have less vesicles that release the neurotransmitter, you end up with things like bradykinesia. Another example is bradycardia can occur if you have too, much, too high uh, calcium levels, bradycardia will pop a lot. A decrease, more commonly associated, can lead to tetany. You probably remember in your studies, look, um, 
Chekhov's sign and uh, Trousseau's sign. If you have, don't remember these, you should go back and review them, but these are as a result of decreased calcium levels that elicit tetany, or um, too much calcium, exciting uh, the uh, uh, motor end plate, leading to tetany. And just as calcium can affect the synapse, so can magnesium, uh, but it's an inverse relationship. Increased magnesium level leads to decreased calcium activity. That's the inverse relationship. So decreased number of vesicles released by the action potential inhibits calcium entry. Therefore, overuse, it's like a hypocalcemic event. So overuse of milk of magnesia, malox, and such high, high magnesium products can lead to neuromuscular impairment, much like we saw earlier with tetany. And decreased magnesium leads to increased calcium activity and increased conduction of impulse. So magnesium is also important for um, a proper synapse. Now, when we talk about action potentials and propagation of the electrical sig sig signal down the neuron, we want to think about two things. One, some neurotransmitters excite the next cell and some turn off or inhibit the response. So we have excitatory or inhibitory responses. And that's important when we look particularly at seizures. Here are some of the neurotransmitters and whether they're inhibitory or excitatory. Acetylcholine, I prefer to write it as ACH, and norepinephrine can be one or the other depending upon the state. Kind of confusing. Fortunately, we don't have to worry too much about that. But you do know, we do know very much crystal clear that GABA, um, if you know the name of it, the long name, good for you. I, I can't uh, pronounce it. Something acid, GABA acid, uh, is inhibitory. So high levels of GABA uh, in, in the, in the uh, nervous system will lead to inhibition of electrical uh, stimulation. Dopamine tends to be excitatory. Again, see here, I've got acetylcholine that says excitatory. It, I think it probably is more excitatory than inhibitory. Ser serotonin, inhibitory. Histamine, inhibitory. Endo endorphins, as you can imagine, are inhibitory. Uh, they cause pronounced um, decreased pain and um, relaxation, right? It's a sense of pleasure. So at any one time, you have excitatory synapses occurring, and then you have inhibitory as well. So that leads to the propagation, for instance, of this uh, electrical symbol going, signal going this way, um, because it's inhibited here, it's inhibited here, so it's propagated along in a certain fashion depending upon the summated EPSPs or the IPSPs. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of confusing, but I think you get it. I hope you do. <clears throat> so excitatory synaptic um, uh, actions generally, as I said, propagate the sig signal. They do that by opening can calcium channels. Remember I said calcium is really important, which allows an influx of, of sodium or calcium and, and it continues that depolarization, that EPSP. And then following depolarization, the cell returns to its resting membrane potential, and the excitation event is terminated. So largely, with an excitatory synaptic transmission, your cell becomes much more positive. The, the neuron becomes much more positive inside, which allows propagation of the uh, stimulus. To the contrary, when we have inhibitory synaptic events, usually carried out in, in the nervous system by GABA and or serotonin, these, um, these neurotransmitters tend to hyperpolarize the cell by opening chloride channels, not calcium, chloride channels. So they become a negative um, mi mini volt, negative mini volts, much more negative inside of the cell. Depolarization will not occur. So the movement is then there. This electrical symbol or stimulus is therefore blocked with inhibitory synaptic 